Welcome to GovCast, connecting with federal IT's top decision makers. I'm Alexander Bolova, production lead at GovCIO Media and Research. With me today is managing editor, Ross John Fortune, and staff writer researcher, Anastasia Obis. Hi, everyone. Hi, Alex. Hey, Alex. So the Pentagon recently released an unclassified summary of its 2023 cyber strategy. The previously classified document was submitted to Congress in May, and it updates the department's plan to, quote, operationalizing the priorities, unquote, in cyberspace. The document is far-reaching, drawing from knowledge gained from the Russia-Ukraine war, as well as ongoing conflicts in cyberspace with China. So we are going to take today's episode to dive into this summary Uh, Note some key takeaways, highlights, stuff to look out for, stuff that ties into what we discuss every week here on GovCast. So I'm going to kick it over to Ross. Can you give us a bird's eye view of what this unclassified summary is all about? The summary really talks, as you mentioned, about this updated iteration of the cyber strategy. This is the fourth one. And the Pentagon is really trying to bring forward what it has learned over the past few years. In particular, they want to bring it to align as much as possible with the national defense strategy of 2022. Now, in that, there's four pillars, sorry, lines of effort, pillars, cornerstones. There's a lot of these kind of uh, foundational uh, lists in these kind of documents, so I get them mixed up. I apologize. But there's uh, four lines of effort that are, number one, defend the nation. Number two, prepare to fight and win the nation's wars. Number three, protect the cyber domain with allies and partners. And number four, build enduring advantages in cyberspace. So what Mika Oyang, uh, who is the Deputy Assistant uh, Secretary of Defense for Cyber Policy, said at a press briefing about the strategy, she basically said that there, these are the things we have to do, these are what we've learned. These are the evolutions we've seen. And we're trying to bring technology in. And of course, if you're drinking, whenever you hear zero trust, take a drink because she said, quote, these are techno- there are technologies we think about as part of a zero trust architecture that would enable us to better identify malicious and anomalous behavior on DOD networks. So zero trust is never far uh, from these conversations. Ross, I want to be very careful about opening Even the idea of a zero trust drinking game, I think we would see a market drop off in listenership after about five minutes of any given episode. But with all that said, I know that there are four main adversaries that are outlined in this document. Anastasia, can you just go over them real quick? Yes, of course, we can unpack how the Department of Defense describes the adversaries and the different levels of threat that they present. So just like Ross mentioned, the National Defense Strategy that was released last year, it describes the PRC as the pacing challenge. We all know that China has significantly modernized its military and in the case of a conflict, particularly if China were to invade Taiwan, it would most likely result in cyber attacks against U.S. critical infrastructure systems. And the intent is to disrupt, distract, and ultimately change the political calculus. Now, the uh, strategy also describes Russia as an acute threat. And uh, we also talked about it at length in Russia's war on Ukraine. The Russian military has deployed cyber capabilities to support kinetic operations, also to ultimately change the political calculus. Uh, When it comes to North Korea, Iran, and violent extremist organizations, the strategy describes it as these countries posing a persistent threat. So, for example, North Korea has undertaken significant malicious cyber activity related to ransomware. Just recently, North Korea has conducted ransomware attacks on healthcare providers in the U.S. and basically used that money to further fund its cyber attacks on other key sectors, both in the U.S. and South Korea. And also, subsequently, some of those hacks targeted Pentagon networks and U.S. defense contractors. And also, we shouldn't forget about 
transnational criminal organizations. And it's basically um, something like ransomware gangs, hacktivists, and state-sponsored cyber mercenaries. And they're usually backed by their host nations. Thank you, Anastasia. So now that we've outlined the adversaries, what actions does the summary suggest for the cyber strategy? The Pentagon is really talking about an offense is a best defense strategy, particularly with regards to the People's Republic of China and Russia. So that the catch, catchphrase, I guess, the way they describe it is defend forward, which to a large extent means that they want to engage um, with China and Russia, particularly being more proactive in identifying and uh, obviously targeting uh, cyber activity that's going to disrupt the things that Anastasia uh, put out, uh, cyber networks, critical infrastructure, those kinds of things within uh, the U.S. Now, China is the big boogeyman in this document as um, I'll plug an old episode of the old GovCast to say that uh, when Steve Blank uh, from the Gordian Knot Center, uh, he talked a lot about China. And I think the, the national security establishment is really interested in the way that China is working in cyberspace, you know, as far as attacking critical infrastructure and systems. And the document lays that out. It says, you know, the, the PRC has engaged in prolonged campaigns of espionage, theft, and compromise against key defense networks. So the Pentagon is really trying to cut these off at the pass by being more proactive in identifying and disrupting these attacks uh, before they become you know, a real problem, as many of these attacks have been. Thank you, Ross. I guess something that we should bring up uh, feels a little perfunctory, but it's worth saying, AI, emerging technologies, what role is it playing? Well, like with, you know, everything else, AI is at the top of mind of the Pentagon. The commercial technology um, and industry innovation is, is so fast paced in that sector. The strategy thus talks about, you know, the DOD is working within that realm and uh, sort of updates this idea that people can't do everything. Now we do need, you know, I think implicit as that is that, you know, humans do need to have uh, the final say in decision making, but AI can process so much data so quickly that they want to be able to use those capabilities as much as possible. Yeah. Speaking of that human component, I see that staffing is brought up in this summary. Is that right? Yeah, there's some some bits in there that I think the workforce people will be interested in. I know having talked to some government managers in general, that has always been a struggle is getting people from the private sector, particularly from Silicon Valley, to come to government is difficult because of the a variety of, of hiring concerns from pay to the pace of, of hiring. But the strategy does talk about the services to bring in more effective talent management, better human capital strategies for the cyber workforce. And that could be as simple as extended tour commitments or bringing people in again, repeat tour commitments, uh, rotations within uh, different cybersecurity mission areas, areas, or better, let's say, progression through the, the ranks. So to have it that these models of career progression are quicker and more obvious to see so that people are more interested and get more incentives to stick around. Right. Anastasia, I want to throw it over to you. What stands out to you in this summary? What do you want to highlight? couple of things. I mean, we don't get a lot from the summary, but maybe I'll talk a little bit about partnerships. Let me just give you a summary of what they're saying about partnerships, but one thing stood out to me. So basically, partnerships are crucial, and that introduces a level of risks as cyber actors target partners' networks with the ultimate goal of getting to the U.S. systems. And 
Ross just talked about the workforce. The Department of Defense will work to expand partners' access to cybersecurity infrastructure and will actually also contribute to maturing their cyber workforce as well. So they have this domestic goal and they have this international goal. Also, it plans to address institutional barriers that stand in the way of effective cooperation. So think information sharing, think analysis, things like that. It will continue its hand forward operations that that's been going on for a while and it's conducted by Cybercom. And what's interesting is that according to the strategy, the Department of Defense will support the Department of State's effort to come to a global consensus on cyberspace norms. So it's going to be very interesting to see what that's going to look like. Yeah, it is just this catch-22 that we repeatedly see of needing to expand access for security, but making sure that that extended network is secure. You know, it's it almost feels like a trade-off, and I guess people are trying very hard to make it not, but I can definitely see where the challenge comes in. As we're wrapping up our conversation, I do want to ask, right now, this has been feeling a lot like a cybercast to me, but we are, in fact, on GovCast right now. So I'm wondering, what does this mean for the federal government writ large? Does any of this have impacts on other branches, or is this more of an example of what's happening across government? Or are there key lessons that other agencies can take away? What makes this GovCast worthy? Well, I think what you just said really speaks to it. When we talk about the partnerships and interoperability, data access, things like that, it does really speak to this larger government-wide concern about security as a whole. In an increasingly interconnected world, how do you balance that even within the the adversarial relationships, you know, we, we talked about China. This is something that has been going on with China for years, which is that a lot of components of technology, commercial technology in particular, sometimes it's used by agencies, civilian agencies and defense agencies alike, contain parts that are manufactured in China. And there, there are some concern, uh, security concerns about that. And there have been various... Uh, rumblings in Congress and at higher level management positions and agencies about this presence of China in the manufacturing space. So how do you bring in these critical things, but also keep things secure to the point where you're you know, comfortable with, with the security level? That's something that is not just in, in the cybersecurity realm, but broadly within the whole of of government, and I think something that uh, agencies are are increasingly dealing with. And to say something that I think I said the first time uh, when I started on on any of our podcasts, the computer is everything, you know. So cybersecurity is very much a part of every part of government because even when we're talking about zero trust, like that is installed as a strategy in every aspect of parts of agency operations. It's just an operational strategy. So it permeates all parts of government. Yeah. And let me add to that something that we've talked about and uh, something that actually the strategy goes in detail on is defending critical infrastructure. And if you think about defending critical infrastructure and exactly what it takes to create a truly resilient system, both within the United States and abroad, it's a lot. So for example, the strategy says that it will leverage the National Guard to basically create partnerships between the federal government and also state, local, territorial, and tribal governments for better cyber defense responses. It also emphasizes that it will expand public-private partnerships. It wants to lean on private sector's technical expertise to identify those foreign-based malicious cyber activity. The Department of Defense will also work with other federal agencies to identify those threats. And, And it also needs to address the Department of Defense Information Network through zero trust architectures. So there is a lot going on 
and a lot of effort that is going to be put on not just by the Department of Defense, but um, agencies across the board. Very well put. Well, we are going to keep an eye on both this strategy as well as all others coming out. I feel like about once a month we are coming back here to talk about a different agency and what they're planning on doing. It's all indicative of this larger push in the federal government, and we are going to be here every week keeping track of it. So, Ross Anastasia, thank you so much for joining me today. If you enjoyed what you heard, make sure you're subscribed and leave a review and a five-star rating on the podcast platform of your choice. We'll be back next week with a brand new GovCast. But until then, I'm Alexander Bolova. I'm Ross John Fortuna. And I'm Anastasia Obis. Thank you for listening. GovCast, along with HealthCast and CyberCast, is a production of GovCIO Media and Research. For more podcasts and to check out the other shows, head to govciomedia.com. Watch out for new episodes released every Tuesday and Wednesday across our shows. You can follow all of them on your favorite podcast platform. And if you like what you heard, make sure to let us know by leaving a review. And if you have any topics you think we should look into, contact us at newsletter at govcio.com. 